the name of Jesus wonderful isn't the name of Jesus wonderful all the world can come to him to have their sins removed isn't the name of Jesus wonderful of Jesus beautiful is it the name of Jesus beautiful son of God in one of us lover of our souls is it the name of Jesus beautiful eternal king
Praise in the name of Jesus, all we need. He's the way, the truth, the life, the only way to God. Is in the name of Jesus, all we need. He's the way, the truth, the life, the only way to God. Is in the name of Jesus all we
Hallelujah. Somebody somewhere give God praise today. God is good. His is the power and the kingdom and the glory forever and ever and ever. Praise God. It's so great to be with you. Uh, if you tuned in early, I understood we had a little problem with sound, but uh, it's all working now. So praise God for his blessings and his, and his goodness. And I'm so glad that you're here. Uh, I've been looking all morning at different churches. Uh, there are a number of churches that are uh, around the state uh, in the Church of God as well as other churches that have uh, gone back into their buildings this morning. Uh, in the next few weeks, uh, hopefully most of us will be able to make that transition. The numbers of cases of coronavirus are still going up, but uh, it seems that uh, the, the very serious kind and the uh, hospitalizations are going down, and certainly the death rate is going down. And so we're going to believe that that's going to continue, and we're just praying for God to kill all of this. And uh, so we, we just thank God that uh, the answer of prayer that God has kept us safe. I, I got a call over the weekend, and uh, it wasn't from an official, but from a friend that said, how's your church, how are people doing? Uh, how many you have out of work, how many you got the sick and in great need. And, and, and so I want to just tell you that we have been blessed. We have really been blessed. When I sit down and look at the, our roles of, of the people who are coming and the people who are members and the people who are family and friends, uh, we are blessed. In some areas, their churches are decimated by what is going on in their communities but we have been blessed. And I, other pastors that I've talked to in our communities, and I'm talking about Irwin, Ben Hill, and Wilcox, I, I'm telling you, we are, all, we are all really and truly blessed. And so thank God for his goodness. I want to just say happy birthday. Uh, according to my list, Vicki Young had a birthday today. Uh, Kevin Merritt turns the big 5-0 tomorrow. Andy Phillips' birthday is Tuesday. Uh, Kim Kegabines is Wednesday. Glenn Dunn's is Thursday. And if I can find somebody this Friday, I'll tell you about it later. But every day we got somebody having a birthday. Now, here's the only thing I want to say to you is I, I, I don't have any cake. And so if I've got five people having a birthday, surely, and I know I missed one yesterday, but um, so don't, don't get on me too bad. But uh, I, there's four others that could just share their cake with us, okay? And so we love you. And happy birthday to you. Happy anniversary. There are several in a month having anniversaries. We love you. We praise God uh, for his goodness and grace. Uh, and so um, let me tell you also that in the Church of God, our camp meeting, which is always well, actually the first week of June, well, is not going to be this year. All the youth camps have been canceled. Uh, we have moved the camp meeting into the latter week of the latter part of July. I think the 20th or 21st. Uh, during the first week of June, they're going to be playing videos on the state office website uh, and Facebook page of old camp meetings. And, and so that might be something that uh, some of you that have been around a few years might really enjoy. Uh, going back, there, they're talking about playing some that they had videoed before we closed the tabernacle in. So that's a number of years ago. And, and so it should be quite, quite interesting because through the years we've had some mighty grand preachers that have ministered in our camp meetings and taught in our camp meetings. And so I want to talk to you today. I want to talk to you about my new series that begins this morning and goes for the next uh, four weeks anyway. I'm going to ask you, what will you leave behind? You know, we've had a lot of talk about death. We've had a lot of talk about issues. We've had to talk about all the corona deaths. We've seen all the movie stars that have died, doctors that have died, uh, influential people through the world that have died. So what will you leave behind when you're gone? The Bible says it is appointed once unto man to die, and then it kind of gives us a comma and says, and then comes the judgment. So I want to know what are you going to leave behind? So we're going to talk about that over the next four weeks. I'm going to lay the foundation today after I throw my uh, uh, remote down and finally try to pick it up. It's further to the floor than it used to be, by the way. And, and so today I want to talk about living beyond ourselves. You see, when the time comes and we're ready to leave this world and hand off these things to another generation, 
What do we want it to look like? We've been told that forever our world has changed. This pandemic, this, this virus that's going around has forever changed our world. Well, the, some of the changes that I've seen have been good. Many of them have not been. But my question is, what kind of legacy, what are you going to leave behind when you're gone? And you see, the highest need to be fulfilled in the human heart is to make a difference in someone's life, to make a difference in our generation. And Psalms 112, verse 6, here's the way it begins. A righteous man says, surely he will never be shaken, but a righteous man. Now, this doesn't mean you've got it going on. This doesn't mean you're perfect. This doesn't mean that you're holy and all that. Really, it only means that a man or a woman, a person who is headed in the right direction because you've had a, a right relationship with God. You've had a relationship with God where God made everything in your life that was wrong right. And the Bible says we're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And because Jesus came into this world, we are now on a righteous path of life that every man, woman, or child who calls on the name of the Lord, he will be saved. And this says a righteous man will be remembered forever. So the goal of righteous living is to live it in such a way that the generation after you, the after me, talks about the inspiration they received from our lives. And that's got to be the goal of every mom and dad listening today. It should be the goal of every believer that's listening. I mean every teacher that's listening, every preacher that's listening, every person who's influencing and touching another person's life should have the goal of being remembered forever. So be, to be clear, I want to tell you I'm not talking about fame or notoriety or ambition or, or our personal ambition for our own glory, but I'm talking about the glory and honor of the one in whom we serve. You see, that's why we live. In fact, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, he says, I, Paul says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. So here's what this means. It means, number one, that you are called. You're not here to suck air, live life, put out fires, Watch other people make a difference. The Bible says that you and I have a call upon our life. And I'm urging you to readjust your life in such a way that you live it worthy of the calling in which you have received. It's almost as if to say, because we are not. Can I tell you honestly? It's because we're not. We always need to, to hone it in. We need to redirect our purpose. We need to sharpen our way in such a way that we're truly making a difference in our lives. So that's what I want to do. I want to I upset you. I want to tilt your water bottle in the wrong direction. I want you to stay up at night. I want you to go home and wonder if you're making a difference, what you're going to leave behind. Because the Bible says that not only are you fearfully and wonderfully made, the Bible goes on to say that you are uniquely called of God. Now, this is not just for the people who are on the receiving end of that calling, even though we're trying to make a difference in their lives. It's not just good for God, but you see someone who is doing their own thing needs to stop and say, I'm going to stop doing what I want to do, and I'm going to start doing what God wants me to do and what God says do, even though I'd rather do what I want to do, I want to fulfill God's calling in my life. Do you know that at the heart of human communication, at the heart of what fulfills you and me, is what I'm talking about right now. When you do it, it answers all the questions of life. Doing what you were created to do will cause you to live better and breathe easier. I don't know, but in college we studied uh, some theories, and it, one of those was called Maslow's Hierarchy of Basic Needs. In 1943, this psychologist named Maslow came up with a list of five things that motivate humans. He basically said, this is why we do what we do, act like we act, or what we are, and what and is what we inherently are striving for in our life. And he began with five basic needs, 
and ended with what he considered to be the pinnacle or the fulfillment. And it's built, if you look it up today, it's built in the form of a pyramid that you would actually climb to the top of it. Each level, there were fewer people who reached that goal, and each level was harder to get to than the last level. And so to meet the, you had to meet the first one in order to reach the second one and so forth. You couldn't choose one, three, and five or one, two, and five. You had to take one, and when you worked through it, you would get to two. And when you got to two, you could work through it and get to three and so on. And over the past 70 years or so, um, those who, who studied this type of stuff, have begun to develop even more, and today they are eight different things, and I'm going to give them to you this morning, and the last one is super powerful. So there are eight basic needs that people have in this life. I'm not talking about your neighbor down the street. I'm not talking about your cousin, your uncle, your aunt, your mama, your daddy, or your children. I'm talking about all of us, okay? So the very first one I want you to understand is physical needs, okay? Physical needs are the most basic needs that we have in our life. It's the, it, the most basic of that is air. We breathe, we eat, we sleep. We have, basic, we have our basic needs met. We need food, water, shelter, warmth. We need those type of things in order that we might exist. And then secondly, we have safety needs. Every one of us needs protection from the elements. We need security. We need order. We need laws. We need limits. We need stability. That's what's happening. That's the problem that we're having with our children today. So many parents are trying to be their children's best friend. They don't need you to be their best friend. They got friends out there. They're usually about the same age as they are. What they need is for you to be their mama or their daddy. And they're looking for limits. And they're going to push the limit until they find out where that line is. They need limits because limits give them security and give them stability. And that's the reason they keep pushing. So you need to understand, set the limit and stand there. Set the, to the end of the road and stay there. And you see, they estimate that about 85% of people are having their physical need, needs met and 75% are having their safety needs met. And then comes uh, the love needs. That is if we will need to belong. We have the need not only to, to love, but we have the need to be loved. We have the need to belong to something. We, have, we are built with a need for affection. They tell us that every person wants to be touched at least three times a day. That's the reason we're starting a more small groups when we get out of this. We've already got one for young ladies going on now. Uh, Tim and Michelle start their couples group back up uh, this Saturday. These are small groups, but they're going to meet a lot of needs. We're going to talk about the Bible. They're going to talk about spiritual guidance, but they're also going to be social groups where we can interact with each other and we can talk to one another and we can learn that all of us are going through issues. And the, and the sociologists tell us, psychologists tell us, that about 50% of people are having this need met in their life. And then fourthly, their esteem needs, okay? Everyone has a need to be recognized and to achieve something. We have the need to be complimented. Everybody likes to be told, you're looking good. You may, you may know it's a lie, but it sure does make you feel good to hear it, doesn't it? Now, if you were in the building this morning, you'd be laughing with me. As it is, it's stone cold quiet. I had about enough of this. You care about two things. You care about what you think about yourself, that's self-esteem, and you care about what other people think about you. Can I tell you something? I want to give you a truth this morning. I want you to hear it. Open up your ears. Open up your eyes. Open up everything you go. open. Turn the volume up. The people that judge, the, the people that matter in your life, don't judge you, and the people that judge you don't matter, and at some point we're going to have to get healed over the people who have messed us over so bad, and, but this self-esteem thing is the reason every one of you were standing in front of the mirror this morning going, didn't know I was at your house, did you? Men and women look in the mirror 
and see things completely differently. I am married. Trust me, I know what I'm talking about. Women look in the mirror and see things that need changing, things that need work. Kathy will be combing one piece of hair. And I'm looking at her saying, what are you doing? See, in my mind, the answer is, move on to something else. we got to go. This is not right. I said, can anybody tell it? Yes, they can. I can tell it. Makes my brain hurt. But that's the way women look in the mirror. Men look in the mirror and they go, "Ah, looking good. What's up, man? What's up, world? And we think we look in the mirror. We got it going on. Matter of fact, that's the reason you, that uh, over large people are so over large, especially men, is we look in the mirror and we look skinny. We got one of those mirrors that came from the circus. I know. My feeling is if I can get my pants up over my belly, I'm looking good. And, and, if, I, and if I had to buy bigger pants, I ain't telling you. You understand what I'm saying? But that's the difference between men and women. And, 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 and Maslow calls these the four basic needs. He calls these the deficiency needs because that's where we see ourselves so much in lack. And too many people are stuck on these four. Too many people never get out of these four, so they never get to the best part of life. And today I want to help you, and in this month, next month, I'm going to help you get to this list where all your needs are met because the Bible says that God will supply all your needs in glory by Christ Jesus because He cares about this. He's the answer to this. God is the only answer for this. You need a relationship with Jesus Christ so that these things in your life can be met, and so you can grow into the other needs that you have need. If those were called, the first four were called the deficient needs, the next four are going to be called the growth needs, and the fifth one is that we have a cognitive need, okay? Every one of us has this appetite to understand. We seek knowledge and understanding. That's why we read books. That's why we like documentaries on TV. Kathy's been turning on some things about Yellowstone, and we've looked at seals, and we've looked at sea lions, and we've looked at all kind of animals, many in Yellowstone, many in the, in the Antarctic and the Arctic Circle. I'm telling you, there's some amazing things out there. I've learned a lot of things that I didn't know. As a matter of fact, I can't remember which zoo it was uh, yesterday, but penguins got out. And they were roaming around an art museum. And I saw those little penguins in their tuxedos. And it's like they were enjoying uh, art. I didn't really like what they liked. But they would walk around. And all of a sudden, they'd stop and look up on the wall at a picture of art. And it was like they were talking to the next one. And the next one was saying, no, I don't like that one. I like this one. And so uh, I've learned a lot of things. So not only do we have cognitive needs, but we have aesthetic needs. Because we all have an appreciation for beauty. We love nature. Many of you are putting uh, your plants and flowers and gardens on Facebook. And I'm seeing them. And I'm thinking, man, you really do have a green thumb. And that's why we like to go to the beach. That's why we like to go to the mountains uh, for vacation. That's the reason we like to watch the sunset and the sunrise. That's the reason we decorate our walls and mow our lawns and put flowers in front of the building. Uh, we, need, we have this need to make things look better, to beautify things. We have this hunger to beautify and understand life. And the devil's plan is to keep you stuck in the first four, the basic thing, because he wants to keep you deficient. He wants you blessed. He wants you, uh, uh, God wants you blessed. Satan wants you lacking. God wants you in abundance. Number seven is self actualization uh, needs. This is the ultimate one. It used to be for many years, but no longer is. It's now number eight, but it's still a great one. Because it's when you come to a place where you realize why you're made. You're beginning to understand your potential. You're having this discovery of fulfillment. It's what uh, that's in you that causes you to strive for the best. It's why you won't settle for second place. That's why we love sports. We're drawn to reach our full potential. Everybody likes a winner. We want to do the best we can. We want to be all that we can be. But it's estimated that only 2% of the population of the world has ever met this level of need where they realize what their potential in life is. They know, they know why they're on the planet. And the reason is that, that 2% of the people 
All but 2% of the people leave God out of their life. God's the only one that can help you get to this place where you realize why you are and what you are. He's got a book on your life. And he's the only one who can answer the questions of life. As a matter of fact, they tell us that only one-tenth of one percent of college students ever have gotten here. See, you're in the right place. Because here at the church, our goal is not to provide you with a place to go on Sunday. But every one of us wants to know why we exist. I'm hoping that most of you, when you come back, after we've been out of church for this long and we've been forced to adopt other ways of worship, that when you come back, you will realize that this is not just a place you go. When you wake up on Sunday morning, we're going to the house of God. We're going to understand not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We're going to understand that we need to be in God's house, in God's place of worship, that we need to be together with fellow believers where we can sing and praise God and shout and celebrate and pray for one another and and love one another. I want to see you get to level 7. I want to see you move from the 98% to the 2%. You see, number 8, we're going to get to number 8. It's not one of Maslow's original needs, but the more they studied people, the more they realized that people have one more need, and it's called a transcendent need. Transcendent need. He said at this level... Your greatest ability is to look beyond yourself and use number seven, uh, what you've learned about yourself, and you're going to use that to make a difference in the lives of not yourself, but in the lives of other people. And it's the ultimate level of fulfillment when you start showing compassion and sympathy and empathy and caring for others and looking beyond your own needs and helping some other person, and it's not done out of obligation. It's not done because it's a requirement. It's done because you love people, and it ultimately fulfills you. It helps you live a life full of meaning. So as a pastor, I'm trying to lead you into green pastures. I'm trying to lead you to a fulfilled life of meaning. I'm trying to get you to go through the levels of need and make this your goal. What does transcendence mean? It literally means surpassing or exceeding usual limits. It's extending or living beyond limits of ordinary experience. It means that we're living a life beyond comprehension. Ephesians uh, chapter 3 says God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. So I've come today to tell you, listen to me, you may be stuck at home this morning. We may not be open, able to open the doors yet, but I'm telling you God has a calling on your life and God wants to do something huge in your life. God doesn't want you to meander through life. God doesn't want you to go on vacation just to have a party once a month. God wants to use you for his glory and in the work of the kingdom. And our testimony one day will be, wow, you're an awesome God. Thank you for using me. I refuse I refuse to stay at a lower level. I refuse to let you stay at a lower level. We're going to take the higher ground on the way to the highest ground. I see your basic needs. I understand. They are real. But we will lead you to a God. We will lead you to a God that cares and the people that care. But it's with the ultimate goal of living a life beyond our normal limits, to live a life beyond ourselves, to live a life that makes a difference. None of us, listen to me, none of us know how much time we have left. I look at how much things have changed since this pandemic started. Babies have been born. People have died. Can I tell you, I don't want to just occupy space in this world until I die or until the rapture of the church takes place. I want to finish well. I want to finish strong. I've watched many begin this journey of life and they've started off strong but somewhere along the way they got sidetracked and they didn't finish strong they didn't finish well I don't care anything about just going through the motions if I did I wouldn't come in here every day 
and get in front of this camera and say, I want to touch your life. We want to pray for you and we want to love you. I don't care about going through the motion. I'm not interested in just preaching and listening to music and going home and talking about, wow, we had a good service and waiting until next week and doing it again. I want to see something happen for the glory of God. I want the rest of my life to count for eternity. I want to make a difference. I want to leave a mark. I want to be remembered. I want to see lives change. I don't want to see somebody pray a little prayer and go on living like the devil. I want to see people whose lives are changed every day. Because I serve a God who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I ask or think. Proverbs 9 and 6 says in the message, leave your impoverished confusion and live. Walk up the street to a life filled with meaning. You see, sometimes we live lives that are confused and miserable and, and hurting. We live lives that have many needs. But the word says that God will meet all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Not my ability. His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So God says, he wants to touch me. He wants to change me and not just leave me here. But he wants to use me and he wants to use you. And he wants to change you and touch you. And he wants to use every one of us to make a difference. It's time the church of Jesus Christ, the church of God, the Baptist church, the Methodist church, the independent churches, the Pentecostal churches, uh, the Lutheran, the Episcopal, Presbyterian, whatever else we may, the Methodist, whatever else we may have. It's time we wake up and make a difference in our world for God. I want to give you three things. It's got to happen in your life for this to happen. Three things. I've given you the introduction. Now I'm going to give you the meat. Three things. Number one, for this to happen in your life, you've got to love God passionately. You've got to want to live a life that makes a difference. If you want to live a life that matters, you can't do it by yourself. The only one who has the potential of your life in his hands is God. And if you don't connect to him, you can't find it. The Apostle Paul used his argument as a way to win people to Christ. When he would talk to lost people, he would tell them there was a reason that they didn't have the meaning of life. And Paul was witnessing the people who were worshiping an, an idol, a cold, dead idol. And under the bottom of the statue was his name. And under the bottom of one of these statues, his name was unknown. He was an unknown God. They didn't know who he was, what he believed in, what he cared about. They didn't even know who they were worshiping. They were just afraid of offending some God they had missed. And so they put the unknown God in line with all their other gods. And Paul told them, the God that he was talking about was the God who had made them who was not made of stone or wood. In Acts chapter 17, it says, From one man he made every nation of men that they, would inhabit, that they should inhabit the earth. He said he did it with intentionality. Before Adam, he already had you and me on his mind. He picked out a time on the timeline of this world to put you and me. And the Bible goes on to say, and he determined the time set for them and the exact times and places where they would live. So I'm telling you, where you are is not random. Verse 27 says, God did this so. Why does that mean? That means God had a reason for doing it this way. You and I weren't supposed to live in the first century. Pastor, I'd really like to live back in Bible times. No, you wouldn't. You weren't supposed to live back there. If you were supposed to live back there, you would have lived back there. God put you on this place. God put you here. God said, I'm going to give you the meaning of life. He did that on purpose. He wanted you to ask what the meaning was. Why? So that you would ask because he's the only one with the answer. He wants you to ask him. He said, God this, did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. You're one prayer away from God getting involved in your life. And the answer to the question in life being answered for you. And Paul quotes a verse in verse 28. 
He says, for in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. And then in Colossians chapter 1, it says, for everything, absolutely everything above and below, visible and invisible, everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him. You have no chance of finding your purpose in this world outside of God. You cannot find it without him. Ephesians goes on. He says, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. He says, it was for a purpose. To do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. What does that mean, God prepared in advance for us to do? That means God has a calling on your life. You were created by God. You were called by God to make a difference. And this should bring meaning to your life and your problems down to a degree where you can handle them. They're no longer a big deal because God's got him in their hand. He's got you in their hand. And if all you have in your life is your problems, then your problems are going to be gigantic. But I'm telling you, you get this scripture down deep in your heart and all your problems just become meaningless distractions along the way because you are living a life filled with purpose and meaning. The second thing, not only must you love God passionately, but you must serve others selfishly. Selflessly, excuse me. The Bible says that we can live transcendently. The Bible actually encourages me as a pastor to commend you to live this way. Paul wrote to Timothy, who was a pastor. He said, command them, Timothy, to do good, to be rich in good deeds and be generous and willing to share. And in this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So the Bible is telling me that if I will help others, it will help me to be what God has called me to be. Oh, Pastor, I work very hard for what I have. I understand. But everything you have is by the blessing of God. Love others. Command them to do good. Encourage them to do better. Encourage them to reach out to other people. Psalms 112 says, They share freely and give generously to those in need. Their good deed will be remembered forever. They will have influence and honor. Doing for others does something for you. Every kind deed does not count in glory. If you just feed a belly and don't share the gospel, it doesn't count. Because full bellies go to hell just like empty bellies do. But we've got to learn to connect the good deeds with the good news. Social justice without spiritual justice is not justice. Spiritual justice without social justice is not justice. We're to combine spiritual and social. We're to meet the needs and tell them about Jesus. He is the healer of their bodies. He is the savior of their souls. Too much social justice, even in churches, is food that's going to spoil because we're not accompanying the gospel with it. Jesus said to work for the good news. So I want to tell you, if you're hungry, we'll try to feed you. If you're in need, we'll try to help. But you need to know we're all about Jesus. In just a few minutes, I'm going to give you an opportunity to know Jesus if you don't. Third one, the last one. We've got to uh, live life intentionally. Acts chapter 13, verse 36 says, For when David had served the Lord, or had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. When I die, I want to know I've done what God called me to do. That the vision he put in my heart was completed. I want to hear him say, 
well done. Can I tell you one of the greatest pressures of ministry? One of the greatest pressures of ministry is not the hours or the preparation or the schedule. It's the fear of not making a difference. Many times I've asked my wife, or I've actually said to her, most of the time I didn't ask her. I just said to her, I'm afraid. We've spent our whole lives doing something. And we haven't made a difference. You know, I hear that old saying, you know, stick your finger in a glass of water and pull it out. Did it leave a hole or did it just cover over? But I'm telling you, one day I'm going to go to the grave or I'm going to go to the rapture and I'm going to go kicking and screaming doing what I know God called me to do. We were talking about some friends this morning. We were getting ready for church. And we talked about how some of their lives had went and how our life had went. And my answer has now become, it's been a pretty good ride, hasn't it? Certainly it's not over, but it's been a pretty good ride. Because God is good. I want to tell you today, when you follow God, God will use you to make a difference. I want to leave behind. a legacy that people remember. Because I want to do what God called me to do. I want you to do what God called you to do. I have a couple of friends that have retired at the very beginning <laughs> of, this, of this pandemic. As a matter of fact, on both of them, I think... The last Sunday in March was to be the end of their tenure. And um, the overseer looked at them both and said, Hey, guys, I just want to tell you, you can't leave now. you got to stay. To which both of them said, Okay, no problem. Do you know why they said, Okay, no problem? Well, Pastor, their plans got messed up. Their, their ideas, their hope for tomorrow got messed up. No, it didn't. It was God's way of saying to them, you have lived in this calling for many years, and I'm not through with you yet. Call yourself whatever you want to be called, but get back in the saddle. Get back in the pulpit. Get back in your calling. I'm not finished with you. I came this morning to tell you, listen to me. I know it's been tough. I know it's been discouraging. The best thing you can do is turn off the TV. Go watch Marshall Dillon or Have Gun Will Travel or Andy Griffiths and quit listening to all that junk. It's only going to keep you upset. I believe the pandemic is real. I believe the virus is real. But I'm believing the media is playing it up just to terrify us. I'm telling you, God is good. And I belong to God, and you belong to God, and we're not going out until he says it's time to go out. And soon we're going to be back here worshiping together. And I'm a realist. I know what it's going to be like. But I'm going to be with you, and you're going to be with me. This morning, if you don't know your purpose and you don't know your calling, it may be because you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Maybe at an early age or years ago, you accepted Jesus and you said, Lord, forgive me, come into my heart. But since that time or since some point in between then and now, <clears throat> you've turned your back on your walk and you've turned your back on relationship. You need to rededicate your life to the Lord. I want to encourage you this morning to pray this prayer with me. You ready? Pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. Change me from who I am to who you want me to be. 
by faith, I accept your forgiveness and repentance of my sins. If you're watching by Facebook and you can, I'd like for you to, if you prayed that prayer, text me, I prayed that prayer. If you don't want to write all that out, it's IPTP. I prayed that prayer. We want to pray with you. We want to be your family. We want to love you. If you don't have Facebook, you can text me personally, 229-425-6168. Last thing, there are a number of you are hurting, struggling. Our prayer list is growing longer. There are many discouraged. We've been told by leadership of, of, of religious circles all over the world to expect when we open the doors that people are going to have gotten calm and they're going to be gotten up. They're going to be gotten uh, lazy, and they're not coming back to church. I don't believe that about you one bit. I believe you're waiting for an opportunity to get up and wash your face, comb your hair, put your face on, and put your nice clothes on, and come back to worship God with us. That's what I believe. I'm not going to tell you who it is, but I heard about one of my members yesterday that said they wore their night pajamas to bed and they get up of a morning and put their day pajamas on. I'm not going to tell you who that was, but I want you to know I love you, and I want you to know you're not the only one doing that. You're just the only one that had the guts to admit it. God's good. I want to pray for you. Heavenly Father, in your name we come. I believe for your touch. I believe for your strength. I believe, God, that you're going to move into the homes and the automobiles, wherever people are that are listening. And, God, you're going to reach down, and by your Spirit, you're going to touch them. They're your children. The Holy Spirit lives within them. Just touch them. Swell up within them. Heal their bodies. Meet their needs. Answer their prayer. Touch them with your glory. Touch them with your grace and strength. And let the power of heaven move, I pray. We worship you and adore you. God, I thank you for your goodness. Let the Holy Spirit settle. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. If you have a prayer request, please send it to us. We want to pray with you. Now, I want to tell you tonight, I'm preaching right where we're living. Jesus said to Peter, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat. That's where I'm preaching tonight. I want you to be back. In the morning through Thursday, we'll be back every morning here in the sanctuary with prayer. Monday nights is children's night, and Tuesday night is youth night, and Wednesday night is our Bible study. The outline should be out tomorrow. Thursday, we will uh, have our, um, we will have our uh, young adults, our sync program band, they all did a fantastic job. And then Friday and Saturday, I'll be with you again from home. We love you. Don't forget, if you're interested in becoming a member of our church, you don't live in our area and you don't have a church home, we'd love you to become a member. Uh, we have e-membership. If you go to our website, which is fitzcog.org, uh, there's, a, there's a four lines in the top left-hand corner. Click on them. It's a drop-down menu. One says, what is e-membership? The second is the application for membership. It's a general information thing. We'd like for you to become a part of our body. No matter where you live, we can call you. We can pray for you. We can reach out to you. We can be your family. I want to thank you for tuning in. I'll see you tonight at 6 again, okay? I love you. God bless. Bye-bye. <laughs>